this this is an important event for us. Um, we're thrilled to invite Patricia Smith back here. Um, I know she's been here before. Um, it, it just feels good to be back together and to be doing it here tonight. I'm sorry spring hasn't come for us. It, it needs to be here, but I'm glad you braved the weird weather and came out here. So please help me welcome Herman Beavers, who will do our official introductions. Thank you so much, Jessica. Uh, I'm going to take off uh, my mask. Um, so um, the, tra the tradition is that I write a very much overwrought introduction for our guests, but in this instance, it's, it's called for. So I'm Herman Beavers, Professor of English and Africana Studies, and tonight I have the special pleasure of introducing our reader for this year's iteration of Brave Testimony. Back in 1999, when the then African American Studies program organized the first Brave Testimony reading, we gave very little thought, and I mean very little thought, to whether we'd be able to pull off another reading the following year, and another after that, and another after that. We had some extra money in the, in the budget. Could be that Oprah donated money to us that she found in the cushions of her couch. Um, I don't actually know how we came up with this extra money, but somehow it was there. And we decided that we should find a way to weigh in on National Poetry Month. And what still feels like a small miracle, we invited five poets to read as part of the series. Terrence Hayes, um, who has gone on to um, uh, a huge reputation, um, including the National Book Award and a MacArthur Genius Grant. He had just published his first book of poems. Natasha Trethiway, uh, who uh, Pulitzer Prize winner, who had only the year before won the Cave Canem Book Prize. Toy Derricott, who had only three years prior founded the Cave Canem Poetry Retreat, which just celebrated its 25th year at this year's AWP conference. Tracy Morris, whom I'd heard read in New York and who graced us with her sound poetry that felt so radically new and pathbreaking. The first reader, however, was my mentor and friend, Michael S. Harper, and if I'm waxing nostalgic this evening, it's only because I want to suggest that the paroxysms of joy I felt over the course of the month of April in 1999 is matched by the joy I feel this evening introducing our guest. So let me start at the place I need to begin, with the declaration that I count Patricia Smith as one of my very dearest friends. Now, those of you who know me know that I'm often given to bouts of hyperbole, <laughs> if not delusion outright. Have you lost your mind? Or as my grandmother would say, what have you done with your mind, child? <laughs> often followed by, if you need help finding it, my, my belt is ready to go. Um, so I mean, seriously, someone might say, Herman Beavers, you are a liar a scoundrel, and a cheat, and those are your best qualities. <laughs> but I stand by what I said. Patricia Smith is one of my dearest friends. Now, I should tell you, counting this particular visit and the AWP conference two weeks ago, this is, if I'm counting correctly, the sixth time that Patricia and I have been in the same physical location. And liar that I am, it's probably more like three times. <laughs> So when we consider the long list of honors and accolades that have been showered on Patricia Smith, the 2018 King Stuffley Poetry Award, the 2018 NAACP Image Award, the Los Angeles Book Prize, as well as her book, Incendiary Art, which I'll talk about momentarily, being a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, you might really think that I have gone off the deep end. You must be out your mind, someone might say, especially when we consider that Patricia Smith is the author of eight books of poetry, should have been Jimmy Savannah, Blood Dazzler, a National Book Award finalist, Gotta Go, Gotta Flow, which was a collaboration with photographer Michael Abramson. Her other books of poems include Tea House of the Almighty, Close to Death, Big Towns, Big Talk, and Life According to Motown. And if that's not enough to convince you just how delusional I am to claim Patricia Smith is my friend, Consider that she's also the author of the children's book, Jana and the Kings, 
and the companion book to the PBS series Africans in America. Also award-winning, but who's counting at this point? I could list all the top-of-line publications in which her poetry has appeared, but let me say simply, Patricia Smith's poetry is damn near ubiquitous. Oh, and if that wasn't enough, if Sister Girl wasn't busy enough, she co-edited the Golden Shovel Anthology, New Poems Honoring Gwendolyn Brooks, and edited the crime fiction anthology, Staten Island Noir, or Staten Island Noir. In preparation for this introduction, I reread two of Patricia's books, Blood Dazzler, which chronicles the lives of people whose lives were devastated by Hurricane Katrina, and the aforementioned incendiary art. In the former book, Smith manages to tell the story of the hurricane, starting by personifying the, the storm. In the very first poem in the book, 5 p.m. Tuesday, August 23, 2005, the storm, still officially known as a tropical depression, as Tropical Depression, depression 12, speaks, quote, I become a mouth thrashing hair, an overdone eye, eye, how dare the water belittle my thirst, treat me as just another small disturbance, end quote. And in Incendiary Art, a poem so full of tragedy and nightmare, I wrote at the end of one section, this is a painful book to read. Um, indeed, my response to some of the poems, more than a few in fact, was so visceral, all I could write at the end of some of the poems was, ouch. The book in its entirety is a tour de force, but the section of the book that wounded me most deeply is When Black Men Drown Their Daughters, in which Smith deconstructs the thinking and actions that led to the drowning death of two small girl children, both of whom are drowned by murderous fathers. If, as she states in Blood Dazzler, quote, every woman begins as weather, unquote, then incendiary art tells us that the lives of black folk, men and women, and with the earth folding in on itself. I can think of no other way to describe the larger impact of Patricia Smith's Smith's poems, except by saying that her poems are often the very embodiment of grief. And in addition, they speak to the need to face tragedy squarely, to give voice to its folds and shadows, to make real its power to strip everything we cherish in an eye blink. Inevitably, though, these poems tell us in no uncertain terms what the blues tell us. If we can give voice to nightmare, we give ourselves impetus to meet the next day. It's with great joy and pleasure, then, that I introduce my bestie, my BFF, (laughs) my sister friend, Patricia Smith, and welcome her to the Kelly Writers House. Die. That's right. It's me and you. Hello, everyone. Hello. It's good to see you. Thank you for being here. I appreciate that. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, very happy to see some familiar and beloved faces in the audience. Um, I am from the west side of Chicago. And uh, you probably don't know a lot about the west side. The west side is the part of town everybody tells you to stay away from. Um, and uh, there's black folks on the west side, black folks on the south side. The south side is kind of, what's the word, Mama Sadidi. Uh, and west side is, those are the poor people, those are, you know. And it's been that way, you know, forever. And you have a reputation if you're a west sider. So I wanted to write a little thing about west side girls and, uh, and start off with that. The west side was where I arced toward the idea of bloom. Under the city's most siphoned and skeptical sun, as it spit dutifully toward rows of threadbare commerce and tilted storefront churches, toward fish shacks gnawed shaky by grease and gossip and that crippled mouse crowing wretched blue note beneath the stove. Toward the Pilgrim Rest Missionary Baptist Church, toward my gold-toothed mama, toward my doomed daddy, and finally toward me. Word drunk, scrawny and luminous with Vaseline, braids tugged stiff, my scalp roaring. The west side is where I licked the gray slick of dubious swine and sucked marrow from stew bones, accepting murder as nurture. It's where I jammed plump peppermint sticks straight into the pungent guts of hot pickles and chomped until I was marked wholly with stink and stain. 
West Side girls have always been enthralled by the failed muscle of everything tasked with ending us. Look how our butts and bellies travel, smooth as silver on water, how we got a million answers to the hisses from the doors of Lake Street Taverns, a million ways to eat chicken, and a million languages so damned good nobody knows. We are all of us, the daughters of Gwen, baby girls of bow leg and explosive nap, our stout legs etched glorious by switch whooping and double dutch scars. Tell us how little we're worth, how ugly we are how our double negatives scar the air. Tell us that our bodies are clogged with cheap meat. Say we'll never be South Side. Tell us how lucky we are that Chicago chose to own us, to dress us in unraveling thread and show us off in its dark rooms of whizzing bullets. We'll just keep on with this beauteous, standing wide like a wall and wearing all that wounding atop our gilded nappy like a crown. So my students are like, I feel so old since we're on Zoom, and I'm like, <laughs> and they're, they're looking at me like, what is your problem? Um, I have a couple of uh, poems about my mother. Uh, this is hard to explain. My mother and I'm an only child, and I'm a daddy's girl from way back. My mother and I, and it took me a long time to be able to say this in public, if we were not connected by blood, we would not be friends. It's really hard uh, when you're in a room, especially of women, they say, but that's your mother. And um, my mother and I just, we just never, outside of her having me, we just never connected. And she was a little upset that I was so close to my father. Um, so, and she didn't speak to me for 10 years. Didn't even know why. Still don't know why. Um, so I have a couple of poems about her. Uh, and, and you can kind of see the progression in my, my thoughts. What daughters come down to. For what I'm sure is the fifth time my mother plugs in a flat mournful hum where the words, I love you too, should be. Then she hangs up without saying goodbye. I squeeze my eyes shut, try to imagine 82 autumns in the bones, in her rasping joints, in the cool jaded thump of what is still a migrant's ever arriving heart. However, I believe she is required to love me. I wonder what God was teaching her all those years, those days after days coaxing raucous hips into deadening girdles and gray A-lines so she could lose her damned mind to organ. Was it all theater, a screeching of north when south was what, was what itched her, all of it mock belly, the nails, splinter spewing cross, some sly spirit habitually overloading her spine, making her dance thirsty and unfolded? How could all those wry hymns and hot-sauced hallelujahs lead to this hum, clipped connect, and hush? I am hundreds of miles away, but I can see where she is sitting, hands still on the phone. Every surface in her tiny apartment is scoured and bleached, draped in a disinfectant meld of rain shower and blades. The kitchen glints. Her rugs are faultless. The purple tulips I have sent for her birthday are insistent feral beauty of blood in the room. Like her daughter, they have bloomed in the clutches of vapor. I love you too, she thinks out loud, but can't. This one. Uh, so after the 10 years, I talk aloud, just tell you my whole life. Uh, after the 10 years, my, I was at a AWP. And the phone rings, and I looked down, it's my mother, and I thought right away, I said, she's dead, because I, I couldn't, and she was on the phone, she said, well, there's this form that they asked me to fill out, and it says that, so I think she realized that I was her only child, and that things were going to happen that I needed to be a part of, and so she just started talking like we had never stopped talking after 10 years. Uh, so now, uh, she is, 
wants me to get things. My mother used to shop for anybody else shop for funerals. I mean, a parent to shop goes to people's funerals and looks at the casket and everything and just goes, "I want that one." My mother was going to funerals with people she didn't know, you know, and then telling me where she wanted people seated and all that. And then one time, she said, "Well, just just cremate me. That's okay." And and so now I'm I'm like because I don't know her friends, I don't know anything really. And so this poem came out of that. Mm -hmm. The price of the end of it. But now it's her stooped body in cue for the slab, her blessed temperature you're fiddling with, and God's holy directive shifts accordingly. Your mother holds the tasteful funeral home brochures an inch from her eyes until their horrible words unblur, shakes her head at the insane cost of the gilded paul born tribute she truly craves, ask again for whatever is cheap. May her Lord forgive you as you just keep shuffling that cremation info to the top of the pile. You remember how stupidly she bobs her napped head to the wagging finger of God, God again, always God, how resolutely she clutches all the bluish notes in gospel. For her, the fire next time is not a frugal means of disposing of soulless shells. It is payback for a life clawed together outside of her savior's cold little classroom. Oh, never you mind the lesson she drilled into you after a handgun blasted your father out of the world, what she said to end your bouts of snot and fever, your worrisome new habit of snatching tufts of hair from your own head and screaming the onsets of dawn. Your daddy's not in that old body anymore. And you unrolled your eyes just in time to look that pliant, just in time to make her think you believed her. Now that she has refused the neat conclusion of ash, you are thinking of all the damned reams of paperwork glorious ceremony requires, the feel of scrawling your name over and over to officially end her. There will be too many syrupy flowers draped over everywhere, the casket lid flipped open, your oblivious mother's vaguely whorish makeup job. You dread the hearse's eerie creep through annoyed Ubers, the depressing pit, mourners sneaking cell snaps, taking note of your absence of ache. While this strange woman comparison shops, zeroing in on the pauper special, girl, what is a cloth casket? You remember years of screaming her name into a dead phone after she scrubbed her whole history of your needy little face. Now that she is frail and beholding, you should demand that she answer for that kind of love. Or you can love that way too. Go on, throw a match into her hair. <laughs> These poets. <laughs> uh, this one was, um, those of you are po uh, who are poets know this, that uh, every once in a while a magazine or something will call you or email, some of the editor will email and say, could you send us a poem? And you don't have anything. Uh, so I kept the amazing John Murillo mm -hmm. waiting for a long, long time for this little poem. and. Uh, uh, part of the time, part of the 10 years I was talking about, I went through a pretty serious bout of depression for a while, and I, I just, I'm just starting to write about some aspects of that. So uh, this poem is, is one of the first ones out of that. I promise I'll cheer up soon. <laughs> <laughs> the title is The Sun, Mad Envious, Just Wants the Moon. The sun, mad envious, just wants the moon out of the way. It knows that I tend to cling to potential in the dark, that I am myself only as I am beguiled by the moon's lunatic luster when the streets are so bare they grow voices. The sun has lost patience with my craving for the night's mass-produced romance, that dog-eared story where every angle is exquisite and ghostly suitors their sleek smells exploding, queue up to ravish my waning. 
bursting with bluster, the, the sun backslaps the moon to reveal me, splintered, kissing the boulevard face first, clutching change for a jukebox that long ago lost its hunger for quarters. It wounds the sun to know how utterly I have slipped its gilded clutch to become its most mapless lost cause. Her eye bulging, the sun besieges me with bright. So I remind her that everything dies. All the brilliant bitch can do for me then is spit light on the path while I search for a place to sleep. Okay, let's see, got that, got that, that and that. Oh, wow. Okay. I will, oh, here it is. Getting things mixed up. I'm sorry that I don't have everything all organized, but I don't start picking stuff until I see people start to come in. Um, and, you know, see what everybody looks like and what you're buzzing about and how you're dressed. And I want to read that. I want to read that for her. I want to read that for him. Uh, okay, so this is um, when I was teaching my, my students about uh, metaphor. And the one thing I vowed to do that now everybody knows so I can't stop doing it is whenever I give my students an assignment or a weird prompt or something, I have to do it too. Yeah, and I said it once and they never forgot it. They passed it on to other students. When you're in her class, make her do this. Uh, so this is uh, The Bed Was a Blues Lyric. Yeah, that's all of it. The bed was a blues lyric, grovel and stank, threaded through with train whistle, the red shred of yesterday's pork wedged in a back molar. It was a broke heart delta reed, the shucking of peas by women rocking on a wraparound porch. It was an old Negro's heart-sick croon trickling from the nib of an exhausted needle. The bed was not plotted or planned. It was questionable haven for a tangle, a sudden wall of rain designed to rearrange a bended neck. It was a bulging suitcase two world-hipped women had to bounce their hard butt bones on to close, crammed full as it was with, can't take this no more, baby, stuffed full as it was with, you ain't leaving, are you? Packed full as it was with, and I wonder, could a matchbox hold my clothes? The bed was every damn thing a man says before he screeches, give me my gun, before he considers the traditionally murderous work of his knuckles and mouth. The bed was last call, a rushed dagger of rot gut and the wide allowed absence of a functional jukebox. The bed was a bed that scraped and rolled, rocketed and spun, levitated and crashed. It was a gnaw in the south of an unbridled belly. The bed was just a little exclamation to growl through a clench in the smile. It was hot dollops of serpentine funk, playing havoc with the perimeters of the room. It was a silver sheet of wet, a rhapsodic progression of restless verb. The bed was defined by a meal of Tabasco splashed on shards of dubious swine. It was the words, the baby, 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 ain't no way words that work on the submerged cadence of a gal tugged all bloody from the hips of Chicago. The bed didn't ask no questions. It was accidental. It was picked up and placed in the wrong damn day. It waddled fro in two like a John Lee hooker behind Coke bottle sunshades and underneath a sweaty tilted beige Stetson. The be bed could not be firmly established. It was a line in a song without a song around it. In its hand-me-down clothing, the bed knew no nurture, could claim no owner, no mother, lover, or confidant. When it leaked music into the clutches of dark, it sounded like a sharp left turn on a flattening tire. It sounded like a nosy pointer finger caught in a crevice. It sounded like a dog numb with mange, wondering where the time done gone. It sounded like the snooty tooth suck of that Baptist preacher and that one, it sounded like the tenacious bend in your 3 a.m. body. It sounded like last month's takeout left to glory in a warm fridge. It sounded like all the fruitless, stupid ways we search for language. It sounded like I love you, I love you, I love you, I don't. It sounded like the vanishing need for bath water and rent money. It sounded like a bass string overplucked by a scissor thumb. It sounded like that. 
The bed was momentarily elated. It forgot its obligations. It kept smushing the snooze button. The bed was sadly deluded. It assumed a future it didn't have. It wrote bad checks all over town. The bed resided at the rock bottom of an indigo bellow. It was also clearly a way out of no way. The bed didn't know its own strength. It was a midnight binge of curdled water, olive loaf, and the slick shining soup squeezed from bacon. The bed was a blues lyric. Sugared revelation from a diseased mouth. It was just a single tear jerked line, slant rhymed and scraping. The hiccuped, I woke up this morning, I woke up this morning, I woke up this morning. The first lie so many of us tell. Thank y'all. Thank you very, very, very much. else did I pull out here? All right. That's what I eat. Okay. Huh. See, now I'm, I'm reading stuff that's on the back of stuff that I was going to read. <laughs> okay. So everybody, uh, those of you who teach know uh, Jamaica Kincaid's girl. And this is, this is after them. My eyes are getting old. You know how those two lines start to move closer <laughs> together? It's like I have to start double spacing at 18 point type or something. Where black begins and don't end. Oh, okay. Don't stick your finger under the faucet. The water's too hot. Wait till I put the bubbles in. That'll cool the water down. Don't put your clothes on the floor. Put the clothes in the hamper. I can't believe how nasty you are. Is that a stain on your underwear again? Hell, stop howling. The water ain't cooled down yet. Let the bubbles... But, but mama, those ain't bubbles. That's tight. So so what you think, I'm a fool? It gets clothes clean. A damn for damn sure can handle your nasty little self. Get on in there, girl. Stop that whining. I don't know that water still ain't hot. Go on, sit down in it. What you waiting for? Mama, it burns a little. Yeah, baby, it's going to burn. That's all that dirt yelling. But you want, want to be this black forever? You want to be this black forever? Sit back. I'm going to sprinkle a little of this bubble on the washcloth. But mama, that ain't bubbles. That's what you put in the washing machine. Girl, you know better. You, you, who know better? You or me? Sit back. Let me scrub that nasty neck of yours. I told you about playing that sun, didn't I? Next time I see you out there jumping rope, swinging your little ass in front of them boys, I'm going to come out there with my strap. Mama, you rubbing too hard. I know for a fact you wasn't born this black, so some of it got to come off. Mama, it's burning a little down there. Down there where? What you know about down there? You best not be one of them fast gals thinking about what you can do with that and how many times I got to tell you how much click... Oh, I'm sorry. How many times I got to tell you how much real clean burns? Just grit your teeth and hold on. We're going to rinse in cold water. But Mama, I don't think I can stand it. There still ain't no bubbles. You got money for bubble bath? You got a job yet, gal? Here's something you can do. Why don't you hold your nose while I'm scrumming? Pitching hard. See if you can get some of that wad out of it. I scrape off this black. You take care of that nose your daddy brought you from Arkansas. Child, that man just put Negro all over you. Bend your neck. Lord, you so black, you damn near purple. I thought for sure this wash powder would do it. Stop wailing. Sometimes clean burns. How many times I got to tell you? I'm telling you now. I'm telling you now in front of my Lord Jesus, you ain't got no damn business being this black. Nobody going to give nothing to somebody that they can't see and ain't no way to get the kind of clean you need to get without a little hurt, without a little hurt, without a little hurt, without a little hurt, without a little. That's it. Thank you. Okay. This one or this one or that one. Maybe something out of this, <laughs> this depressing book. Okay. Oh. Uh, some things that I don't usually read. Yeah, okay, I read that all the time. Um, hmm, okay. So everybody, the people who are my age, I saw y'all walk in, I know you. Uh, <laughs> remember, um, I don't want to say it out loud in case you've been trying to tell everybody you're another age. I'm like, no, I know all y'all. Uh, remember the shadow box? That everybody remember the shadow? Did anybody have a, a mirrored shadow box? 
you say no. <laughs> um, and you put little stuff that people would bring you back from trips and little porcelain, little trinkets and stuff like that. Well, there was always a little fat pig in it, a little, a little pig with red cheeks and, you know, with something on the side like I came from Tuxaloosa or something. Uh, so I wanted to write about that. And, and so Enigma of the Shadow Box Swine. What was the import of the wee porcelain piglet? Nobody really knew, but there it blared, zippy-eyed, nuclear, curly tail, ass-backed by a reflection of itself, on a prime shelf often joined by its more mystical kin, unicorns, roosters with lips, tawdy dragons gazing deep into days they didn't have. The moppet bore no resemblance whatsoever to the fragrant carcass we siphoned of blood and scraped clear of bowels for the reunion barbecue. Every Negro household had at least one shatter-prone piglet as treasured keepsake, swiped lovingly with pledge every other Sunday, shuffled fro and two. I said that already, fro and two. Okay, depending on the... <laughs> I'm, I'm going to edit my book while I do this. Uh, <laughs> depending on the angle of morning light, as decreed, the Lord was represented, wistful on the sweat-stained back of an old AME fan or ceramic and indigo-eyed, all-knowing, always crucified. And there was that funeral program for Uncle Walter, Mama's big brother, who got old and older than just wasn't anywhere, but sure did look like he could just sit on up out of that casket and a nicked souvenir saucer from Natchez with a dewy cotton feel undulating in pastel steam. Higher up, that grease-fingered still of dead, dead Emmett Till as deterrent, next to a tiny gold-rimmed teacup, all we knew of elegance, and that one murky Polaroid of gray, unreachable relatives. But always, stark center, our plump-cheeked porker, a gilded city hog crafted to remind us of where we had come from and what we had come to live high on. Thank you again. Uh, do, do, do. Are you guys mad that I'm doing this like this? <laughs> I'm just like, uh, let's see. Oh, I know exactly what I want to read. Oh. <laughs> okay. So I have a very, very strange mind. I don't think you can be a poet because every day you step outside, things just hurtle towards you. Like, write me, write me, write this, do this, that, you know. And so I have this uh, fascination with cartoon characters when I'm teaching my students persona. Like just today, in the hotel, I taught a class on Zoom, and uh, we were talking about persona, and there's this little poem about Beetle Bailey. Beetle Bailey, the cartoon, okay. So Beetle Bailey, for those of you who are really young, is a cartoon, popular 50s, I guess. Uh, Beetle Bailey was a soldier, always trying to get off by, you know, by sleeping, you know, always getting caught in a hammock or stealing things from the mess hall. And he had a big, mean, red-faced sergeant, and every comic strip would end with them yelling, and he would catch Beetle, and they'd yell at each other. That was it, you know. And it, yeah, it was just over and over and over again. Same thing. It ran for years. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's okay. Don't worry about it. It it ran it ran for years and years and years. And uh, there's this one little poem, and it's the day that Beetle is discharged. He's going home. So it's Beetle on this bus, and it said, and I wish I had brought it because it's really small. But Beetle is talking to this man next to him. And they they get off the bus together and check into a hotel, and and Beetle slept in this man's arms that night, and then at the end of it it says, Sarge, uh, all you had to do was say, love me, Aww. and I will never think of Beetle Bailey again, without thinking of that poem, you know. So you you, you give real life, like I did I did Olive Oil, okay, Olive Oil, Popeye's girlfriend. What's her story? Why is she down there? Why is she on the docks? Where her people? Why, you know, she keeps going back and forth between Bluto and Popeye. Bluto ties her to the train tracks, tries to the train tracks, and then Popeye comes and lets her loose, and then she goes back to Bluto, and it's a happen all over again. It's like, what is wrong with you? So I thought, I'm going to write this funny poem about olive oil 
you know, and, 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 you know, I thought it was going to be funny, but then I started it and it was like Olive Oil Talks to People magazine, right? And then it was, if you, if you must know me, first know this. And then it got serious. It was all about abuse and assault and, uh, oh, you know. And so you can take these things that you thought you knew and you can give them other faces. So, Tom and Jerry. <laughs> so y'all watch Tom and Jerry, right? So if you've watched it enough, you see a pair of black legs, right? You see, a, you see a pair of black legs. This is a maid or whatever. And sometimes it's just her legs. Sometimes she has a voice. She'll say something, but you never see her face. So my natural poet curiosity, I was like, who is that? Right? And, and you know, the internet will tell you everything. Not only did I find out who it was, but she has her own website. <laughs> And her name, of course, because I'm sure somebody white came up with this, I'm sorry, was Mammy Two Shoes. Oh, no. Mammy, and all you knew about her were her Mammy Two Shoes. So I'm mad already, right? So I was going to write something funny. But then I found out two things. She is, Tom is her cat. Tom was given to her to entertain her or whatever, because, of course, cleaning the house is not enough entertainment. And, wait, Tom is her cat. There was one other thing I forgot. Well, anyway. Okay, so this is my Mammy Two Shoes poem. Long introduction. I'm sorry. Okay. It's called Mammy Two Shoes, Rightful Owner of Tom, Addresses the Lady of the House. I am double negative charm, carrying the syrupy burden of your love in my yawning breaches of body. When I laugh, the sound is a knotted oil on each breath I draw, my lips spread wide so you can see that my canines are obediently filed flat. Without an evident engine, my bite is no threat to you or the lily-spiced skin of your throat. I stammer, spurt submission, and rewind, suppressing venom beneath what I'm sure you have forgotten is an African tongue. I am master of the Google eye, manage vex and fluster when confronted with your chirping wisdoms. I throw up my buttered hands in surprise and joy whenever you choose to say my given name. For the godsend of shelter and food you barely remember not to throw away, you expect me to be a sexless stovetop stinking of cinnamon and fat. You don't tell anyone how inconveniently black I can be, how you have to bolt my ghost to the kitchen floor so you can find me in the morning. I'm only simple-minded on cue. I have hidden in the dry dark of the pantry, weeping, twisting the light from my fist to keep from striking you. I have plunged chunks of bread into leaping grease and crammed my mouth away from exploding. You believe that yes is all of my language, that I am conjured entirely a bulbous glare and the head sag, forever on the verge of a grand gospel weep. You want to believe that I believe that a merciful God laid me at your feet. But there are days I feel my heart from my knees to the tile, thudding through calves as thick as the trunks of trees, calves kissed by the scalloped hem of a daisied apron. My chapped heels overflow my shoes, so I walk as if I was being dragged, so, so much easier on the soul. How many times should I bless you for blessing me, missus, with that tomcat, scheming, skanked and feral, flea-munched, out of his mind with motivation and mange? How many ways can I thank you for pushing a cat into the space where any other woman's child would be? You gave me that look down, a feisty relationship with the floor, permission to wag my flabby finger at something, a little push-pull, oh no you didn't, kingdom to rule, an official reason to flap my gums and call and call on Jesus. I say, Tom, you's in that ice box. you best start praying. I screech, Lord, Lord, Thomas, is that a mouse? And just like that, I'm up on a quivery dinette chair, a chair bound to collapse with my overload. Everything about me a jiggle, my eyes stunned like they've been slapped from behind. In 20 years, you've given me pussy and vermin, 
the same way you gave me your squirming, babbling, corn silk crowned boys who started their lives by scarring my breast with their blunt new teeth, who climbed my body and rode every weary surface that would hold them. Their stubby fingers, gloppy with jelly and snot, they pried beneath my head rag for the mystery of my hair, scraped my forearm and cheek raw, and looked for black to be that something alive beneath their nails. And yes, they've slowly gone stupid with the sugar, lard, and mouse droppings I shoved into their bowls, then into their mouths. And I smile. I slip a tiny razor into the space between my teeth and the wall of my cheek, and I smile. At night, after I loudly thank God for the each of you, I never sleep. I shamble along the floorboards, the nosy cat licking my heels, that mouse skittering blue beneath the stove. Sleep threatens, but I'm careful not to swallow. Just outside your door, I listen to the capture and unlatch of your breath. I move the blade to my resting tongue. Again, I moan, yes. And God says, don't. She's, she's angry. Why is, why, is, why is she so angry? Okay, I'm gonna do this. Um, I just realized um, somebody asked me about uh, writing happy poems. <laughs> and I just realized that all these poems I picked are not happy. I think it has something to do with some of the things I've been seeing on television lately and how they, how they messed with that beautiful black woman on television. Um, so I'm, I'm going to try and think of something happy. They were say, we don't want to be happy either. Uh, I just, and I, listening to, I just realized that there are phrases that I like so much and they're, they're in my poems over and over again. There's, there's always a blue, there's a mouse beneath the stove, because that, that comes from my, uh, there was a mouse trapped under our stove once, and this is horrifying me. And my mother says, not making any noise, and at night it would be, ee, 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 you know, we couldn't get it, it was awful. So that's still there. Uh, and there's a couple other, oh, I talk about fat a lot. Um, it, there's something else, there were like two other things that I heard again, but yeah. This, and there's fat in this poem too. Oh, and I talk about peppermint sticks going down sour uh, uh, pickles, sour pickles. You've had that, right? No? I don't know what's wrong with y'all. What's wrong with y'all? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you take, uh, when you're on your way to school, and there'd be a big barrel of pickles, and you'd ask the woman for, sorry, she would put her sleeve up, and she'd go down, and she'd show you the pickle. you go, no, too small. She'd go down, she'd get another one. She'd put in a single-ply paper bag. Yeah, you're on your way to school. You don't need a sour pickle, but you, yeah. And you bite the top of it off, and you get a straight peppermint stick. And you plunge the peppermint stick down the center of the pickle, and then you eat the peppermint stick and the pickle together. Wow. You ain't lived. <laughs> and it's so, and it's so, it, it, it was such a thing that recently you can go into a Walgreens in downtown Chicago, and they will have shelves of the, the, the pickle in the packet with the juice, you know, and the peppermint stick right next to it. Wow. They know. Wow. They know. <laughs> I know at least two of y'all are gonna go crazy until you try it. So <laughs> go right, go right with it. Um, all right, I think I'll do this one. Yep. Uh, this is um, this was my goodbye to 2021 when I thought everything was gonna get better. <laughs> I was like, bye, 20, remember 2021? You were yeah. like, bye, thank God you're gone. Um, uh, oh, no, no. So the, the complaint at the end of uh, 2021, uh, wait a minute. Oh, no, this was at the end of 2020. In oh, wow, okay. So yeah, because there's a lot in here about the, the pandemic. 
but I was talking to a group of women and they were talking about the their uh, the fact that they hadn't been touched and not necessarily sex it's just touch you know and so uh, I started to write about that and it just went off the rails <laughs> this is a lot of stuff so it's it's at the end here but uh, okay one you once believed it's only touch I want until what you were given was too much of it. Those toxic droplets drift and swerve, infringing on your blood, corrupting it, their needle clutch the same as murder. It stuffs your lungs with mud and scrapes your buckling throat with all its fitful blades. The virus is a flood of mercy's absence. In its lethal thrall, you pray in tongues, you swear you are not your that you swear are not your own, a frenzied moan that mangles verbs you longed assumed were God. Lord, I atone for my whole life, you say, an outright lie that won't unlatch your breath and teach it how to know the air again. Two, on fire would George's body burn to trifle in its quest to writhe and flail. Two, on fire would George's body burn, burn to trifle in its quest to writhe and flail, to twist away. Perhaps we should all learn the firepower of a knee, the knife-like wail of boulevard beneath a face, how best to die hashtagged and wide aloud and pinned like prey and folding slave into his voice. Sir, I cannot breathe. And did you hear him say, I want my mama, like a man who saw his mama's face dead, dead as it was and reached out for her Baptist heft with his whole raw and thinning throat, a phlegmy no-shit screech that trended till his mama rose to see her man-child crawling home, his neck beneath a knee. Three, the fire eats the firewood gone. It haunts, devours a whole bodega's quivered shell, and scars the hands of marchers as they chant and insist that they matter. The hissers swell. These boys are proud. Their pink distended guts are jailhouse inked with shaky silhouettes of whores they claim to love, prancing swastikas and misspelled spit. It is their comic threats that grant them spine. Those bandoliers, the bullets lined up and aching forward, screeching names you recognize, the names of your brothers and your sons. The guns are hefted, ludicrous and almost never taking aim, although the boys swear they are one with the wrath of God. Four. Alone with the sheer repetition, you must turn away from the pile of bodies, all the lost and becoming gossamer, the fallen, spurned, the unacknowledged, tubed and ventilated, tossed to the hallway, the heralded, the walked the hell away, the panther and the valentine, bespectacled justice, careening mamba, the trouble, good and necessary. No, every morning does not have to be crafted of their names. It is only the idea of having pressing heart upon their heads, bulging with their bodies, and this is only if you're black and were raised Baptist. Child, you will die counting the dead. They are in their silk beds beneath the wheels of patrol cars. There is even one waiting for you at the end of your life. Five, you turn to face only yourself. You see that even air is aging you. The air is what you need to live, but it is also a compromise of killers. Air is haven for ancient snot, knife to the polar cap, home for the ash that dances up from the skin of the dead. Try not to think of the wars air has waged on your body, how hard you trusted its nurture, how you must now mask yourself against it. It's said that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, but what if the, what makes you stronger can't stop, won't stop trying to kill you? Oh, we're being silly. Take a deep breath. Breathe. What? You can't breathe out again? I warned you. Six. The man, oh God, this is Trump. Okay, I'm sorry. The, 
The man is a crude lyric trapped inside a mouth throbbing with rot. Whenever he speaks, what tumbles out is always instruction, rancid as sewage, dictation for his overwrought soldiers, monosyllabic gospel from the god of Oxford and wingtip, the god of washed money and atmospheric tax bracket, the god of men who see no need to wash their legs because suds like money flow from the top and disappears everything beneath. He knew a black man once, old, what's his name? Oh, good old, what's his name? Who suckled his children? No, who gleamed a mean boot, who bowed reverently at perfect angle? No, who probably hated him, who spat phlegm in his whiskey, who still waits for him, hiding that same fist in his pocket, that same blade behind his eyes. Seven, you cannot open a door that has never been closed. Don't misconstrue what is waiting for us. Someone will call you nigger this year, same as the last. It will be whispered with just a tinge of spittle. Someone will say your American name, African-American man, African-American woman, into a cell phone. You be will be reported for walking, for eating, for breathing toward the wrong subdivision, for insisting upon your given name. In Long Island, New York, when they see you coming, two boys will pose, laughing, one with his knee on the neck of the other. In Alabama, where your mother was born, a young girl holds the sign, Black Lives Splatter, and it will look as if someone, maybe the girl, flung fun droplets of red paint all over the placard and is proud of her work because when the camera finds her, she grins, God damn it, she grins, and history binds your hands before you can slap her. Eight. Your utter blueness, wretched like the South in 1950. You've unearthed gut bucket, brown liquor music, the needle romancing that same growling groove. Suddenly you know why Aretha took on all that body on top of her own, why that woman shot Sam Cooke, what Whitney saw in the water. Your government has cursed you with solitude, threatened you with no less than a slow, breathless end to your days, so you torch sage and converse with all the nappy-headed ghosts you have gathered, and with both the sun and the moon, who are already so done with your ass and its endless diary. For months it's been you and your keyless crooning, songs with new revelations about bitches, songs with no discernible words, songs about lonely people so damned out of love with their aloneness, but if they merely spoke to someone, it could kill them. Nine. Everybody okay? All right. Is this 1950? Damn it, all we ask is that we stop magically slipping cuffs and murdering ourselves in the musty back of squad cars, that they stop finding our bodies in the middle of the goddamn day dripping from the arms of trees, that skittish cops don't see cocked guns in our faces, in our cell phones, in bottles of soda, in the stairwell, in our mama's yard, in mixtapes, in our wallets, in our beds, behind our closed doors, <laughs> through the window, in our empty upraised hands, in the backs of our heads. We've run out of space on our memorial sweatshirts, the ones that name all those slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, all the times Mama Lucille that something has tried to kill us and has not failed. We have run out of room for the lineup of names their mamas gave them, trusting they would live long enough to own them. And the font on the shirts gets smaller and smaller. Soon we will run out of shirt, then we will run out of skin, then we will run out of breath, and damn it, that's all you've ever asked of us. 10. A tongue can burst open borders. A pen can make a whole throat, can take down the words of a father who is griot of the front porch, who hauled his verbs all the way from Mississippi, and his northern daughter throws back her head and wails that same music to the rafters. And the Reverend Thomas, or the Reverend Williams, or the Reverend Greeley will tell you that they write with the hand of God, that their impossible rollick and moonwalk on Sunday morning is the Lord's message messing with their old bones. You can see a tongue makes saviors. Don't let anybody human put their hands on your poems because what you need to say, you need to say. Mm -hmm. 11. Come, it will be hard. 
You'll scream. You'll curse your mask and rip it off. You will have to remember how to breathe full and fluid. Your first attempts will be laughable. Gulp, choke, and sputter. Thousands will call you a fool. You will still see enemy adrift in the air. You are part of a conspiracy. See, you did not die, and neither did I, they'll say. There are a million more dangerous things. Hell, everything more or less is out to kill you. Yes, it is, you'll say. Then you'll smile. Nothing has changed. 12. How hard can it be to crack the stubborn rust of us? We often think of a new year like a page turning, but what if the words are foreign, crackling under their own weight, scripted in a fresh and feral blood? I really just want my root back. I want my Alabama mother, who I do not love, not to die. I want to fit all your wriggle and strain into the circle of my arms, and I want to not die before loving all of you, wide and aloud. I want the page to not turn, I want the page to not turn, not to turn, until we have wrestled control of the story away from those who would trumpet it as their own. Think of the many who have pretended our skin. I said that I do not love my mother, and it was a long, long road to saying that. Sometimes the scenery along that road was too much to take. Sometimes there was nothing to see. There's only two more. Thirteen. What rides your skin like the crave of a kiss? Let's say that in this year, as in all the others, you strive to be happy, to drench yourself in shea and rose water, to listen only to music that threatens your heart and shows you why to weep. Let's say you don't give this new year a number, but a reason to bother you awake. What write poems that slice into your sleep, roughly shoving your dreams aside. Remember that happiness is truth twitching beneath all its mad disguises. If you do not love your mother, say that. If you cannot love your father, say that. If you do not love yourself, say nothing. Just give me time to reach you. Fourteen. These are all the lines in the other poems. Fourteen. So now you know that touch is what you want. It's firewood for your body. It's the burn that eats the firewood gone. Inside your haunt, alone with repetition, where you turn and turn to only face yourself, what you've become is lyric trapped inside a mouth that cannot open. Don't you misconstrue your utter blueness, wretched like the South in 1950. Damn it, all you ask is for a tongue to burst your borders, just to come so hard you stutter and melt your mask to shreds, so hard you crack the stubborn rust that rides your skin. Your crave is to be kissed in 2021. I wish you this. Aww. Oh well. <laughs> How's it going? Huh? Uh, I'm trying to think of something funny. All I have is this book. And it's not funny, <laughs> in the least. Okay, just give me one second. Okay. This isn't funny either, but it's not unfunny. <laughs> okay, I'm going to try and do this. Uh, I have, I'm going to try and do it by heart. Um, ooh, it might not work, but hey, we're all friends here. <laughs> um so uh, I, I, I love characters, uh, and I, I'm thinking of characters in my neighborhood when I was growing up, and uh, there's this barber, uh, and he was wonderful. Um, he, and you know the barbershops, black barbershops on Saturday, on Saturday morning? At least some of y'all know black barbershops. It could be all barbershops, I don't know. But, you know, you come in and it's this little, little staticky radio playing and there's like balls of hair rolling all over the floor and somebody's sweeping them up that they're not going anywhere. And then there's these posters on the wall with like the numbered cuts and you pick the number that you want and you know you don't have enough hair for it, but you pick it anyway, you know. And then the barber, the barber's always talking about everybody. Uh, and 
everybody who passes by the window outside, they got some gossip about them, you know, and sometimes they forget you're sitting there and they start talking about you. <laughs> oh, no, that's okay. I'll wait till you leave. That's all right. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and if you listen to it, there's a real rhythm to the, to the talk. So I was trying to recreate that rhythm. Uh, I'm talking because I'm thinking, Patricia, you don't know this whole poem, but I, I might. I, once I get going, once my mouth starts moving and sound comes out, sometimes the adrenaline takes over and it didn't work. So there's a, a barber in Chicago named Terrell, and I was trying to recreate his, his voice. Wish me luck. Well, look who comes walking into my barbershop, still wearing that jerry curl. You know, man, it's 2000. Ain't nobody got no time for that grease trickling all down their neck as hot as it is out there. <laughs> Come here. Let me pick those naps out. Let me cut the... <laughs> Come here. Let me, let me pick those naps out. Let me cut... Oh. Okay, I'll just do one more poem. I cannot... It's been so long. Oh, let, let me cut those naps down. Let me cut those naps down. Okay, this is this is nice. This is like the actor's studio poetry <laughs> poetry edition, okay, right? All right. Okay. Let me put those up. Okay, come here. Let me cut those naps down. Come up. Oh, okay. Wait, wait. I, I might go one more line and stop again. Okay. Well, look who comes walking in my barber shop, still wearing that Jerry curl. You know, man, it's 2000. Ain't nobody got no time with that grease trickling all down their neck, especially hot as it is out there. Come here, let me clip those naps down. Couple of weeks, I'll hook you up with a fade. The sisters don't like putting their hands in that greasy mess. And did y'all see that child Aretha on stage at the president's thing, trailing all that fur like she's Queen Elizabeth and all that fat underneath it? I ain't never seen no black woman with money stay fat. Chicken see her coming, even the bones get scared. That child will eat a spaghetti strap. What's that song she's saying, Ain't No Way? Well, I guess it sure ain't. She got one chance, though. If you stay alive long enough, time will make you skinny. I just don't know if she got that much time. Oh, yeah, there go that gal I was telling y'all about. Got enough ass to bounce a drink on. I'm going to be knee deep in that come Friday night, and my name ain't Terrell Anderson Jr., and I ain't got my hand tussling in y'all nappy heads. Man, she don't know me yet, but she will. I bet she already heard about how my love making, then put a few sisters on crutches. <laughs> how I done whipped some of this nature on them, now they drooling, barking like dogs. Hell, y'all can laugh if y'all want. Thomas, you ask your sister. <laughs> and you over there, ask your mama. They say size don't matter, but it do if it's this size, man. I have to bind this to my leg, it will scare y'all out of here. Come Saturday morning, y'all can ask that gal y'all just seen. She be passing by that wind in a wheelchair. Mark my words. And one too many times, I didn't seen your wife over there across the street in the butcher shop. And the meat she asking for ain't what makes it to your table for supper. <laughs> she's all behind the counter like she's interested in the butcher's business. What she's interested in is the butcher's business. And you better start taking care of business at your own home, my man, before she get a taste of that sausage she's selling. Then you should be able to hear talking about she gone, she gone. Man, women are liberated nowadays. You can't be climbing up on top of them. This is great for your series, right? You can't be climbing up on top of them, poking them like you got somewhere else to be in five minutes. And every time you get a chance, there you are up in the Continental, sniffing all up Deborah Ann's young butt like she wants something from you beside that Money you always waving around. Man, let me tell you something. When you see flies buzzing around a woman, and it ain't summer, it's time to move on to another woman. I don't know, though. Your wife got some nice legs on her, though. If that butcher don't take up on her, I might get in line. <laughs> and uh, wait, wait, what you talking about talking about some activator? You better activate your head under this razor and let me cut that stuff out of there. This is 2000, man. Listen to me. Black man is free now. <laughs> Super flat and flu. I've been cutting hair for 40 years. <laughs> oh, this is the last line. It's like, flat, super, okay. So, uh, yeah, 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 okay. <laughs> I've been, okay, I've been cutting hair for 40, is it 40 years? Okay. This is, okay. Black man free now, super flat and flu. I've been doing this for 40 years. 
I, oh, I'm getting mixed up with another poem. Uh, oh, and I've been doing this for 40 years. Now put your ass in my chair and put Bring your head over here. And my head and yeah, thank you. <laughs> now put your ass in my chair and your head in my hands. Thank you, Raina. <laughs> That was the worst ending to a <laughs> Kelly House radar. Yeah. Anyway, thank you all very much. Now, does anybody have any questions? Questions? No, yes. your relationship with your mother and how, oh, sorry, thank you. I wanted to ask when you were talking about how you don't, you only really are close to your mother because uh, of blood, right? And I wanted to ask, I know that must be painful in so many ways, but are there any things that you find that you gain from that kind of relationship that you maybe haven't been able to find in other kinds, or do you think it's truly just kind of a thing that happens? Um, you know, it's like so many other things where when it's happening, you think you're alone. I mean, and even in gatherings of my closest friends, I would not say anything about that, you know. Uh, they're talking Mother's Birthdays and Mother's Day and things like that. I wouldn't say anything. So if nothing else, it has made me closer to both a circle of women uh, who have in varying degrees that same issue uh, and also closer to my female friends and... Uh, I think that I really, really treasure the friendship uh, of women who are older than me and also women my age. I think I'm getting a lot of the discussions that I should have had with my mother. And that was a, that was a real gap because the things about growing up and stuff, I, I just, there was nobody to talk to. I didn't have, I didn't have a brother or sister or anything, you know. And so when, what I didn't get my, from my father for a long time, I was just, picking teachers. I was trying to adopt teachers or anything, you know. Uh, so it's made me more um, more aware of, of how treasured female fl friendships are uh, and how that a, a mother, the way that a mother is defined is not always where you find it, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so yeah, it, it's, and, and my, my relationship with the, the, the main thing that happened really is my mother wanted a child to kind of cement her life in the north. You know, she says, I want a north, you know. And, uh, and, and that didn't fix everything. So she got involved in her church, and so she was always off going to places in the church and all that. Uh, and I'll tell you one thing, and, and this is so you realize what I'm talking about. My, my husband and I went to my mother's house uh, because she's, uh, she was in cognitive decline, so she had a suitcase full of photographs and we wanted to to sit with her and maybe go through the photographs while she could still remember some people and a bunch of curl cornet polaroids not not big family photos things like that and uh we thought so we got the suitcase we opened it and we started and it was my mother in a church fashion show my mother on vacation my mother here my mother doing this my mother at work my mother you know and we went through a suitcase and uh, and my father's death certificate just in there. Uh, and my husband looked at me and, and, and he said, well, there's another suitcase. And she said, no. Uh, so all my school photos, all that stuff, she had given to my father and they lived apart. So when my father was killed, she did nothing with his apartment and people came and cleaned it out. Oh. So I don't have any, outside of what's on my first cover of my first book, mm -hmm. uh, I don't have anything any physical photos of myself as a child so yeah so it's deep it goes really deep and a friend of mine from grade school just sent me some sent me uh some class photos and stuff but my my dad who i was really tight with had all that stuff and my mother out of spite because she felt i loved him more or something gave him all those things and then just let them well so it's it's a multi-layered thing now uh, anybody else? Yes. Hi, good evening. Hi. Uh, wow, just wow. Um, oh, thank incredible. You. I, um, I, I, I was just so moved by every, every poem that you read. I felt every word. And I feel like you write so free. 
and there's been a lot of, um, and so so free that there were some things that you said, I kind of just like cringed a little bit, especially around uh, race issues. And there's a lot of talk, especially in the um, artistic community about the white gaze. And I'm, I'm just wondering, um, how do you manage that? How do you balance that? Especially going in and out of uh, predominantly white institutions, teaching in um, predominantly white institutions and also presenting your material to mixed audiences. How, how do you balance that? And you didn't shrink on anything. <laughs> You're like, you'll love this one. Wait, you don't hold, you know, y'all still with me? And I'm just wondering how you navigate that in your work. Um, the first thing you should know is that the poems you are hearing, uh, even stanzas within poems, are the end of a long process. You know, um, I too, you know, I got introduced to poetry by getting up on stage and doing it. So while I was aware, I need to go back even farther than that. Farther than that, okay. Um, when when I was a kid, uh, my mother's gospel was that. Uh, do whatever you need to do to be presentable to white people. So we could be sitting watching television and she would reach over and just hold, wordlessly just hold my nose during the, the, whole, the whole course of a television program because she thought my nose was too broad. You know, uh, and, and even when I, I remember being like in my 20s and her calling me up at work and saying, uh, are you treating those white people right? They gave you that job, they could take it away. So for me, the first incarnation of the white gaze was everything. I was adjusting myself, my home, you know. Uh, I was, everything I did was in preparation for that gaze. When I started to do poetry, uh, and it went through a couple of stages. First it was just kind of performative, but then you realize how uh, you're really just exchanging stories with people. And that was, a, that was a very important time to me because I realized that you are charged with the telling of your own life story. And if you don't tell it, you give, it, you give someone else permission to do it. And that's a very frightening thing, I mean, even within your own family, you know. Uh, so going in and out of these institutions, I have to not feel like I am the intruder. I'm the outsider coming in. It's the idea that nothing you have done in this institution is anything I can't do. I'm not coming in on my knees. I'm not coming to beg you for anything. You know, I'm coming in as, as an equal. And so you come to my story as I present it. Okay, I've had to come to yours all my life. <laughs> You know, I, that was presented to me as mainstream. This is what you are, you know, this is the beacon. This is what you, and, and, and so for most of my life, it was like, how do I get like that white person? How do I get like uh, rich like that one or this and the other? And no one's ever had to come and meet us where we are because they perceive that as being down, you know. And so when somebody says, you know, well, there's something in this, not black writing, but something in your writing I don't understand. I, I used to do that thing where white audience, I, I would say, oh, I've got this poem about going to the Louvre. And, uh, you know, and I, would do these, I would do these white, you know, and then, uh, you know, but you could be in front of a black audience and you don't even, have you ever seen like a black comedian just not even tell a joke, but say something like, bid whisk, and everybody starts laughing just out of the familiar, at, you know, because it's a shared story. So I would, I did that for a while, and I do. I'd have my poems over here, and then I said, "Why am I not reading?" I would, I at the time, I would be more willing to read white poems to the black audiences than the other way around, and that's when I really had to question myself or what I was doing because there's no. We're always talking about there are no conversations where well, there won't be any conversations, and I'm not going to do this and explain it to you. I'm just going to do it. And then you need to see what's lacking in your life and you don't understand it. You know, because we've had to do that forever. You know, so, and sometimes I have to, you know, like I, I'm um, teaching a part-time uh, visiting professor at Princeton now. And Princeton is a whole other. <laughs> it, it's, it's, yeah, it's a thing. It's, 
it's a thing. And, and, and then you've got, not only do you have that gaze behind you, but you've got this history, you know, this history, the history. Uh, so that, that's been something, but I, I, I bring, uh, writers into the classroom and the first person I brought in the classroom doesn't have any books. One of the best poets I know, he, he, he considers himself a hip hop culturalist and he got started out tagging subway cars. And, and, and writes and, and talks about that, you know. And I said, everybody's not on this track. Mm -hmm. This track does not make you talented. This track doesn't teach you poetry. Mm -hmm. You need to see some of these people who have always been doing this and are doing it better than you're doing it right now and are not concerned with, you know, I've, I'm writing three theses this year and my major is molecular robotics or something. <laughs> <laughs> Or something, but yeah, it's it's just the the gaze. Uh, we need to gaze back. We need to gaze back and not lower our eyes because I think the gaze was meant to make us feel like we can't hold the gaze. We can't lock it. Like we we have to do this and then they win, you know. But uh, there's things you don't know. Hey, you know, I have to be strong in in what I'm doing. And I'm your equal. So if that's a problem for you, then that's something you have to deal with on your own. But that's, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. She's walking around with the, the uh, excuse me. Thank you, Patricia, as always. But what, that was a wonderful question that just got asked. And the follow-up question that occurred to me is, you're from Chicago, which was and is uh, a, a core site for the black arts movement. Mm -hmm. And I've realized I've never really made this connection or known this about you. But was there any way your formative years or at any point with your work, were, were you ever influenced by those energies from the black arts movement poets in Chicago? Chicago. Uh, or elsewhere. Yeah, and I kind of talked about this before, about Chicago being a very segmented scene in a way. So when I was, uh, there's the North Side, which used to be yes, the white people lived on the North Side, the more well-to-do black people lived on the South Side, the poor black people lived on the West Side. The, uh, the poetry slam and the performance uh, thing that I got involved in was on the North Side. Um, I got accused at what because I was slamming a lot and I was winning and doing stuff and I got accused by uh, one of the most prominent poets on the south side as part of that mo movement is that anytime there's a black person involved it has to be a competition which was not which was not true but it was the kind of the beginning of let me tell you why I'm doing this and maybe you can come and see, you know, what, what's going on here. So Haki Matabuti, Sandra uh, Apoku, Angela Jackson, people like that, uh, it took us not feeling like there was this chasm between either the, the modes of poetry, written and performance, South Side, West Side, all that, to, to kind of come together in a, in a central place and really look at what each other you know, what we were doing. And of course, since I grew up in the same kind of place, like I was, along with the Southern influence, we have to, it's all of a sudden, it's a surprise that we're doing a lot of the same things. We're writing in a lot of the same ways. And it just took a lot of time, but of course, naturally influenced because we had the same things that we were drawing from, you know. And, and so Chicago, I, I don't know if I would, I can't think of any other place I would rather have cut. There was so much going on all at once. I mean, you wrote a poem and there were like five places that night to go read and we used to just go over it a big bunch and go to all of those places, you know, and read. And then there's something in Hyde Park, which is on the, on the south side. We go over there and see. So now I think there's a, um, there's an underlying conversation that keeps going. It's like, what, what can we learn from each other? Some of the South Side students came over to the North Side and, you know. Uh, there will always be suspicion, 
you know, there'll always be suspicion, like what's in it for you, what's it, you know, but the people who provide the grounding for the scenes are, are pretty much of one mind now. Yes, Raina. So the follow-up question around influences and what has influenced you, and you had spoken about being a visiting professor at Princeton and talking with your students about like learning um, a, from poets who may not have the book or whatever, all that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm interested in what influenced and influences you in your poetry, and then how does that come into your teaching? What makes your class, a specifically Patricia Smith class, that is informed by those influences. Mm, okay, uh, a lot of my, a lot of my influences, nobody really would know. You know, uh, every Sunday I would come into a space where there was a long open mic, there was a featured poet, and then there was a poetry competition. In that open mic were people who bagged groceries and housewives and uh, the guy who just got out of jail and and for them there was no more important place to be that night they might have only read one poem they had that one story and they wanted to get it into get it onto the open air and maybe you never saw them again or maybe that you saw them again and they never read another poem or something so the the courage to get up in front of a room full of strangers and say i cannot not say this you know, and then have the, you know, it, 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 like I said, it was like a tunnel of energy all night, back and forth. Here are our stories in the air. You know, that's when you find out someone comes up and says, I have felt that way. I did just didn't know there was a way to express it. Mm -hmm. That's when you feel like you're, you, you realize you're not alone mm -hmm. in whatever it is that you're doing. So that was, that's really, and so I still call on some of those people. Mm -hmm. It's like, can you come to my class and talk about, you know, and they're, they're doing other things now, but poetry had that, that primary importance in their life for a while. Um, I am influenced by Gwendolyn Brooks, and I'm influenced by Gwendolyn Brooks because uh, growing up on the West Side, I was like this. I was looking over where I was, basically to downtown Chicago. How am I going to get out, 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 out? And Gwendolyn taught me to look at where I was. Listen to the preachers, listen to the, the rhymes of the school kids, go into the bars, go into the churches. You know, these are not things that you need to be escaping. They're things you need to be understanding. And so that, that comfort with where I was without always thinking, how do I need to change myself to get out? Uh, and plus her, her um, just her brilliance at, at form and voice and, you know, I mean, I still, there are things people are still trying to figure out how it came to her, you know. Um, so I, I keep her in mind. There's also, I know when people ask me, sometimes they think, oh, I'm going to reel off these, all these black people. There's a poet by the name of Stephen Dobbins. Mm -hmm. Stephen Dobbins, when I didn't know who I was, supposed very when mm -hmm. I was still doing, um, a performance and didn't know who I was supposed to be reading. I got I had no poetry smarts. I volunteered at a, a bookstore just so I could read the poetry books when it was not busy and I pulled them down. I started with A. I pulled down three or four books. I'd read the first two or three poems. Either they were uh, either they said something or they didn't. Mm -hmm. And I I found a book by Stephen Dobbins called Cemetery Nights. Mm -hmm. And um uh, the first thing I said was, you mean we're allowed to write about this stuff? It's the stuff that happens to us in our lives that we, we pave over and say, thank God I don't have to deal with that again. But then you become a poet and you look around and that pavement's going like this. <laughs> it's like you need to confront that. So it was, it was little everyday horrors stuff that you know and and the one poem i can i can uh tell you about that really stuck with me it's a poem called the gun where uh, a little boy is terrorized by a, a, a slightly older boy and uh the kid gets him into his garage or his attic or something and and finds that he has a gun up there and he he just makes the little boy do stuff and, and the boy gets so scared he wets his pants and then he says, oh, you sissy, get out of here. 
and he steps outside, the, the boy steps outside, and it, it says something about his neighbors are uh, undergoing, undergoing the errands of a, a, a typical Sunday, mowing a lawn, trimming a hedge. And the end of it is, where is that sense of the world you woke with this morning? Mm. Now it is smaller. Now it is smaller. Mm. Now it has gone away. Mm. Right? Mm. The little things that change the way that you look at life, that have, you know. And so Stephen, who became a really good friend of mine later, he had his own trials and tribulations. Mm -hmm. uh, but he, he just, and it could be because he was one of the first I mean, there are a lot of other people doing that kind of work, but it, it kind of opened me to the possibilities. Uh, in terms of the class, uh, I think that the key for me is not to walk in like, I am, I am teacher, you are student. I think it's really important to them, for them to know that I had kind of a weird fractured path to what you know, because especially at Princeton, they expect that all of their their uh, professors are going to be Pulitzer winners and, and things like this, and they may see little hits of things like that in my bio, but I want to let them know mm. it, it ain't like that. You know, it's, it, it was me just thinking, no strategizing, no nothing, just love writing and keep writing, and I think good things will happen. Mm. Uh, but their lives are, are laid out for them. I said to them, what would happen if you went home and told your parents that you had decided to become a poet? And they just fell out. They were just like, this is not that, you know. Uh, and I said, well, how does it feel to have everything already decided for you? And you can't take that left turn. You can't, you know. And so by, by showing them ordinary people who feel like they don't have any other choice but poetry, and the type of the the kind of response talking to them about the responsibility of poetry it's not just a recreational exercise or a class you take to get that a i mean it's hard work that's another thing yeah. they think let me go in here and get this a you know and you know i said do you know and, and to show them what goes into a single line so you will never dismiss a poet again as being one of the le the least talented writers you know, we take these huge unwieldy stories, put them in these tight control spaces, and when we open up the space, that whole damn story is still there. Nobody else can do that, you know. Um, so I'm trying not to be their sister, but I'm trying to show them that there are other paths, and I don't ever, I, I don't think I've used a book for a while, you know, because I always wind up not liking or getting out of it. So it's really interesting. Like today, what did I do? Oh, we did we did ABC Darians and Golden Shovels. And uh and they were all happy. This was the Princeton class too. They they're they're strange. Anyway <laughs> uh and we were doing that and then and then I said, Okay, well you can do either one of those you want. I said, but I had these pictures of all these um sculptures and I said, but now we're going to talk about ekphrastics. So now you can do your golden shovel or you can do it, but it has to be focused on one of the, you know. So I'm, I'm, I add little hiccups for them, and they enjoy that because they're so used to having things straight and, and no nonsense. And I just add stuff at the last minute. They like that. They call me Prof P, you know. Um, but they've been, they were tough nut to crack. They were tough not to crack, and, and uh, I can just see their shoulders relaxing when they come into class because mm -hmm. they are so pressed. And I'm sure it's the same here. Mm -hmm. So much pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, and that you can use poetry to kind of counteract, you know, to, to mm -hmm. counter that pressure. There, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be an assignment. It's something you can keep doing. You can be a, a nuclear physicist and write poetry. As a matter of fact, you know, make me understand what you do. I mean, the the first thing I said, well, what's what's your major? And this one girl, I, I can forget, she said, I'm going to be a diplomat. And I'm like, who does that? <laughs> you know, and then they were saying these things I didn't understand, you know. And then I said, okay, so you want to be a molecular biologist. I said, what was the moment in your life, what happened in the real world that made you choose that? And that's what I want you to write about. And one guy said, well, my father spent the latter half of his life in a wheelchair. And I, wanted, I don't want to see that happen to anybody else. And I said, 
that's the story. Mm -hmm. That's the story, you know. So I, I need to get that, trying to get that layer and get back, get, get them back mm -hmm. to that, mm -hmm. where, where their passions moved them mm -hmm. as opposed to being moved like checker pieces around some academic board. Okay, you're welcome. Last yes. One. Last one. Oh, okay. Oh, is that okay? Can oh, can I can hear you? I can put, I can repeat it if you want. Oh, there it is. I think so. <laughs> they gave you the <laughs> mic. You can I can sing if you want. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I would like to know what has been the most challenging thing about writing poetry. And also, is it okay if I share a poem with you afterwards? Afterwards, sure. Uh, the most challenging thing about writing poetry, uh, I guess I, I, I could say uh, the closer the writing gets to you, the closer it gets to the people around you. Uh, that can be an issue for a lot of people. Uh, writing about family, things like that. Although my family is very small. <laughs> Although one time, I uh, my a cousin came to a reading of mine, and I had a poem about her mother in a book, <laughs> and it was not yeah. So I I went. I said, oh, and I and I had told them. I knew she was coming, and I said, uh, don't sell this book. And the next thing I see, she's walking around with the book in her hand, and I said. Oh, let me sign that for you. And I, <laughs> I went back in the green room somewhere, and and my my partner in crime, Tyamba Jess, got a, a a blade and was slicing. And because if you just tear it out, you can tear where you can see where the page was, right? And he sliced. We sliced the poem out of the book. Anyway. All right, that stays in this room. <laughs> That stays in this room. Uh, okay, the most difficult thing, I think, has been the question of witness, what, what witnessing means, uh, whether or not you can, you can uh, if you have access to stories that don't belong to you, people say, stories outside of your own lived experience, if, are you able to write those things? Like, was I, uh, was I supposed to write, or did I have permission to write about Hurricane Katrina, even though I'm not from the Gulf region? You know, uh, there are, and so I've had long, deep conversations about what being a witness means. And if anything comes up a lot, it's, it's that question, and it's kind of in my head every time that I write. Uh, you know, whether you're writing about uh, a, a, a robbery you saw and you're using real names or something, it's like, where does that stop? Where does it start and where does it stop? You know, uh, that's, that's, been, that's been the pretty difficult thing because the, the more you witness, the wider your story gets and the wider it gets, the more people are involved. Uh, and, and so what about being a poet gives you that permission? And that's a whole other, that's another hour right there. <laughs> Everybody's nodding like, yeah. Yeah, that's another hour. Uh, uh, that's it, right? OK, thank you guys so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Ooh, this was fun.